Welcome to Pastor Bill's Classroom. This study is in the Acts of Jesus, Lesson 30, Focus Lives. Welcome back. Good to see you. Ready for our next study in uh, Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 16. We left off last time. We're basically going to be within the same story, Acts 22, Acts 16, I'm sorry, 22 through 25. We'll be there in just a second. Let's, um, let's begin with a word of prayer. God, we are grateful for every day and the blessings you bring into our lives, and we humble ourselves before you, and we're grateful for how you use us and how gracious you are to us. I pray that by your grace we would understand what you're saying to us, and we'd be motivated uh, within ourselves and motivated to go outside of ourselves into our world. Bless this study now. Bless those who hear it, Lord. May it reach out to all who need it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a study uh, done by a lady by the name of Vicki Medvik, a professor of Northwestern University. She studied Olympic medalists, and she was interested in their, she was a psychologist, in their, their psyche, trying to figure out how they thought and how they felt about things. She found it very interesting, uh, the different, depending on who won the medal and who was on the stand, uh, which stand, um, uh, how they felt about it. Of course, she, uh, very interesting, I mean, I guess not, not, uh, not rocket science, that the gold medalist was always the happiest person on, on, on the medal stand, but something very interesting that you might find, and I find very interesting, is that she said the second hap- happiest person of the three, first being the gold, the second happiest person of the three was almost always the bronze medalist. You would think, intuitively, that it would be the silver medalist, but it's not. It was a bronze medalist, and this is what she found out. It was because of focus. She found out that the silver medalist, more often than not, was focused on the fact that they had, how close they had come to being a gold medalist, but had not achieved that, whereas the bronze medalist was focused on how close they had come to not even being up on the platform whatsoever. And so, for that reason, they were the second happiest of the, of the trio, uh, and, and I find the conclusions uh, very interesting. It reveals a very fascinating peculiarity about human nature, and our, our focus determines our reality. Our focus determines our reality. How we feel is not determined by outward circumstances, truly. It's not. It's determined by inward focus. Or let me put it a different way. Our internal attitudes are more important than our external circumstances. It has to do with how we feel. And, and really, you think about it, I mean, if, if, if this were not true, then again, intuitively, logic would say uh, all rich people are happy and all poor people are sad. And, and we know that there are exceptions to both. There's lots of rich people who are not happy. And there are lots of poor people. Some of the happiest people in the world are people who have no, almost nothing. So, so it's not the circumstances. It's their internal attitude uh, that, that makes a difference. John Milton uh, said it this way. He says, the mind, it's its own place. And in itself can make a heaven out of hell or a hell out of heaven. Isn't that true? Haven't you done that? I know I have. I know I've seen people do that. I mean, we know people who are, uh, uh, you know, on both sides of the thing. We know people who can find something good to focus on in the worst circumstances. We know people who can find something bad to focus on in the best of circumstances. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, another universal principle out there that says if we, we tend to see what we're looking for and uh, we tend to be shaped by what we see. We tend to see what we're looking for, and we tend to be shaped by the things that we see. There are essentially only two types of Christians in the world. One is the worshipers, the other ones are the complainers, and we've been both of those, I bet. The, the complainers can find something to complain about, no matter how good the circumstances, and the worshipers can find something to worship God about no matter how bad the circumstances. And I, again, I find it very interesting. We, we, see, we see that we become what we're looking for. We become what, we, we, we become what we're focused on. Like I said, uh, we're, we're, we're either the silver medalist or we're the bronze medalist, but it doesn't have to do with the circumstances. It has to do with our focus. It's not a matter, listen, of choosing what is reality. We don't have that power. I mean, reality is reality. We can't change it. We, we can make decisions, but, but ultimately, uh, circumstances are what they are. We cannot choose our reality, but we can choose how reality shapes us. We can choose 
how reality shapes us. And we're going to see that today in our study here in Acts. And we saw it last time, even though we didn't major on it. But what happened to Paul and Silas, and so they've crossed the Aegean, they've started the new mission there in, uh, in Europe the first time that uh, the gospel has come to Western culture. Uh, it's just a monumental circumstances. And yet when they get there, things are not that great. Uh, and they struggle. And it doesn't go probably most likely the way that they thought. And so, so what's happened now is they've tried to help this little girl who's demon-possessed, but now the town people have risen, risen up against them. And we pick up the story here in verse 22. A crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off of them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened. Well, they gone to the bottom of, of, the, <laughs> of the prison. Fastened their feet in the stocks. And about midnight, Paul and Silas, it says, were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening. And apparently the, the jailer, they were all listening to them. What, what, a, what an incredible statement of faith. And like I said, we saw last time that things weren't starting off so well for Paul and uh, Silas. And, uh, and now they've gotten themselves in this circumstance, or I should say their circumstances have gotten them into this situation where they are in the jail. And if there was ever potential for them to go low emotionally, spiritually, I would suggest to you it's right now. It's right now. I mean, think, think about it with me. So, so, so they're, they're somewhat disillusioned because of unusual circumstances that face them there at Philippi. They're shocked by how quickly things uh, went south, uh, delivering from the demons possessed girl, and all of a sudden, man, things just spun against them. They're just trying to help somebody, and you know, no good deed goes unpunished, and here, here they are. Uh, they're, they're a long way from home. Nobody that they know there. Uh, they're hurting from a bad beating. They're spent emotionally, physically, spiritually. If they were going to go low, it's going to be now. That's not what happens. What it doesn't say in verse 25 is that around midnight, Paul and Silas were sitting around complaining about their circumstances. It doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say it because that's not what they did. So, so let's consider what they've done here or let's analyze what they've done and see how we can apply it to our own lives. What they've done here is what I'm going to call a zoom out. They've zoomed out. Instead of zooming in on their circumstances, they've zoomed out on the larger issue at hand. They've zoomed out. It's something that we can find very true. When we get into a spiritual or emotional slump, it's usually because we've zoomed in on a problem. Just as true. It's usually because, not 100%, but almost always, it's because we are zoomed in on a problem. We're fixated on something that is wrong. We're focused, listen, on the wrong thing. On the wrong thing. It, again, we can't change the circumstances. We can change our focus. Nine times out of ten, the solution is zooming out so that we can get some perspective. So yeah, the circumstances can be bad, but you really need perspective What's going on here? Here's an illustration of perspective. Here's an interesting letter written home by uh, a young co-ed in college. Here's what she says. Dear mom and dad, I have so much to tell you because of the fire in the dorm set off by my by student rights. I experienced some temporary lung damage and had to go to the hospital, she says. Ooh. While I was there, I fell in love with an orderly and we've moved in together, mom and dad. And I've dropped out of school. When I found out that I was pregnant, eesh, and I got, he got fired because of his drinking. So now we've moved to Alaska. where We might get married after the birth of our baby, and then she signs it, your loving daughter. Wow, <laughs> that's, a, that's a shocker, isn't it? And then skip several lines down. It says, P.S., none of the things that I said before this are actually true, but what is true, she says, is that I did flunk chemistry, but I thought I would give you some perspective on that, she says. Wow, smart, smart girl, right? Sometimes, sometimes that's what you need, though, isn't it? You need to zoom out a bit and get some perspective. I mean, some, something goes wrong and it feels like it's the end of the world, but, but it's not. It's not. 
It's not. Need to zoom out. So how do we do that? How do we zoom out? I want to give you a one-word answer to that question. The way you zoom out is worship. Worship. Worship is by far the best way to zoom out. Worshiping is taking our eyes off the external circumstances and focusing on God. Taking our eyes off of the circumstances that can and will change and focusing on the one thing that does not change. That would be God. Stop focusing on what's wrong with us and on our circumstances and start focusing on what's right with God. Paul and Silas, uh, they could have zoomed in. They could have complained about how bad the reception was over in Philippi. I mean, come on, God, you gave us the Macedonian call across over the Aegean Sea. We figure everything's going to be uh, uh, peachy, uh, a bed of roses, and here we get over here. There's no men to even meet with, and this one lady that, that, that comes to faith in Christ, she's not even from here, and then now we try to help this little girl starts following us around town. She's demon-possessed, and we deliver from the demons, and it doesn't, you think we were doing her a favor. Sure enough, the whole town turns against us. Now we've been beaten. We've been thrown in jail. They could have zoomed in. They could have zoomed in on all that, but they didn't. They zoomed out, and they worshiped. Here's what worship does. It restores spiritual equilibrium. It restores our spiritual equilibrium. It enables us to see what really is going on. It enables us to pull away and regain perspective. It enables us to find something right to praise God about even when everything else seems to go wrong. Nothing's more difficult than coming up with good stuff, right? I mean, I'm in the worst circumstances. How do I, how do I praise God in these, in these circumstances? Well, worship, listen, is not based on circumstances. It's based on the character of God. It's based on the character of God. I, I want hear, hear me hear me on this, and because I'm going to differentiate a word here for you. Worship, listen, is exercising our response ability. I know that sounds like one word, but I'm separating. There, there are actually two words that have been stuck together. I want to pull them back apart. We have a response, and we have an ability. So let's, let's reverse those. An ability to respond. God has given you that. Responsibility means you have the ability to choose how you respond. Your response able. You're not unable. You're able to choose how you respond. Response ability. Responsibility. Uh, a guy by the name of Viktor Frankl write, writes of his uh, experience as a Jew in the Holocaust and the prisons of Germany. Uh, and the concentration camps of Germany during the Second World War. He, he survived, uh, but he said it was a horrible place. Of course it was. It's where he said they stripped you of everything. All your clothes, all your family, all your loved ones, all your identity. They even ceased to give you a name. All you had was a number that was tattooed uh, uh, on, on your wrist. He said it was horrible, but this is what he said. He said they could strip you of all those things, Everything can be taken from a man, he says, but one thing, the last of human freedoms, the freedom to choose one's attitude in any set of circumstances. That is so true. That is so true. We have response ability. We are able to choose our response. You have responsibility. That's why Paul writes what he writes over here in Philippians chapter 4. Look at it on the screen with me. Chapter 4, verse 8. Look at what it says. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lonely, lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on such things. So you have the ability to choose what you think about. You have the ability to choose what you focus on. You have the ability to choose how you response, your, your response. You have responsibility. Your troubles and problems are a reality. I'm not saying they're not. I'm not saying they're a figment of your imagination. I'm not saying you shouldn't feel bad because of them. I'm just saying, yeah, they are a reality, but so is God. So is heaven. So is the truth of his word. 
They're a reality, but these are even more. So focus on those things. That's what Paul's saying. That's all he's saying. You have the ability to respond, to make a choice, to choose a focus. Albert Einstein said it this way. He says, you can't solve a problem on the level it was created. Boy, that is true. So if it's created on a physical level, where do you have to go to solve it? On a spiritual level. That's where you go. You continue to focus on the physical level, it's just going to get worse. Like I said, you need to zoom out. You need to zoom out. And, And what brings us to this spiritual level is the same thing that Paul and Silas do. Such a simple process. They choose to worship God. They choose to focus on the reality of God. They choose to focus that although things seem to be falling apart, God's in control, this is his gospel, this is his mission, this is his work, and it may be the end of us, that's okay, even if that happens, because his mission, his gospel, his truth will continue. Response ability. They were able to choose their response, and they took care of it in worship. Such a beautiful point. Such a beautiful point to take, to take home with us. Let's pray together. God, I thank you. And no matter what our circumstances, you're bigger than those circumstances. Those circumstances are reality, but so are you. So is heaven, so is your word. It's reality. And we have to choose what we're going to focus on. We have to choose where we're going to zoom in on these circumstances. We're going to zoom out and see who is really in charge here and what's really going on. And God, especially in the troubled times that we live in today, we really need to take our response ability seriously. So to zooming in on every little bit of news and every bad thing that's out there, and it seems like that's the only things we're getting, and it's not true. It's not really true. But it becomes reality for us when we focus on it. Help us to zoom out, God, and take our ability to respond seriously and to turn and worship you for who you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.